also a very deep and I think depression subject. God's prescription for depression. I guess one of the greatest problems, we're continuing our study, uh, many events in the Old Testament series of sermons I got from David Dykes. Um, but I think one of the greatest problems in America today, and around the world for that matter, is this problem of depression. And I want to say from the outset, listen to me carefully from the outset, and this is God's prescription for depression today, based on the life of Elijah. But there are all kinds of depression. Okay? There's, there's, it's not wrong to be depressed. Everybody say it. Right. It's not wrong to be depressed. It's wrong to stay in it. And sometimes you must get God, you follow God's prescription. If you still have depression, then you need to seek some help. Amen? Always. There are all kinds of things that cause depression. Financial trouble cause depression. You can lose a loved one by way of the grave. That causes depression. You can, um, you can have an emotional problem that causes dep- all kinds of depression. It's not wrong. You're going to see some of the greatest men in the Word of God went through times of depression. So I don't want, we have a stigma in our country and in our society, I think, that says if you're depressed, uh, something wrong with you. No, that's just a normal part of life. When you lose someone uh, that's close to you by way of the grave, you, you're going to be depressed for a while. Say amen. amen. That's just normal. So what I'm talking about is the word I'm going to give you today is the first steps that I think you need to do. A lot of people are depressed simply because they don't follow what God tells them to do. And uh, there's three basic things here we're going to talk about today. But then there's sometimes after that there can be chemical imbalances and different things that are taking place in your life, such things as serotonin and uh, things like that can get low. So sometimes you need to seek some clinical help if you need it. So let's, let's begin with that. Listen, I've been, I've been preaching on this through this series for quite some time today. And you think after a great spiritual victory like Elijah had on Mount Carmel, remember last week we talked about that? He found, he uh, withstood all the false prophets and failed. You would think after a, 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 a victory like that that he would not uh, be depressed, but we soon find him in a pit of depression. That's what I want to talk about. Have you ever seen a doctor write a prescription? How many of you can read that prescription of Dr. Rose? No. I figured it out. They send it to the pharmacy, and it's written in a handwriting that nobody can read except the pharmacist. And together, the doctor says, what it says is, I got mine, you get yours. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, that's what it's going to say. I got mine, you get yours. But do, do you think you ever had, how many of you ever had a bad day? Let me tell you about a man who had a really bad day. He said, and I'm reading from his, from his report now, he, they filled out from the insurance company. He said, I was laying bricks for a wall and a project. And when I finished the top of the wall, there were some extra bricks. Now, not wanting to drop the bricks and risk breaking them, I fixed a pulley out of a beam and I ran a rope through the pulley down to a barrel on the ground. And I pulled the barrel to the top of the wall and tied the rope off on the ground. I climbed up on the scaffold and started putting the extra bricks into the wooden barrel. I then climbed down and I grabbed the rope and untied it. I was going to lower the bricks to the ground, not realizing the barrel of bricks was heavier than I was. The barrel came down and I was jerked off the ground by the rope and I didn't have the presence of mind to let go of the rope. Until it was too low on the way up, I collided with a falling barrel of bricks and it gashed my shoulder. Then when I was pulled to the top, I jammed my fingers in the pulley. And when the barrel hit the ground, the bottom of the barrel broke. The bricks fell out and suddenly the barrel was lighter than me. So I went down and the barrel came up. On the way down, I collided with the barrel again bruising my legs. I fell right on the top of a pile of the bricks, causing multiple cuts and bruises. At that point, I completely lost my cool and let go of the rope. That's when the barrel fell on me and hit me on the head, requiring 15 stitches. <laughs> now, that's a bad day. <laughs> that be one any worse. That's a bad day. Something to say about it. I want to tell you something. Let me tell you something. 
And great people suffered from depression. Abraham Lincoln, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, the wife of Billy Graham, Ruth Bell Graham, suffered from depression, periods of depression. I suffer from depression myself from time to time. It runs in my family. My mother was, had depression. Now, none of us, well, my sister did have clinical depression. I've never had clinical depression, but uh, depression is something that runs in, and it's not wrong to be depressed. Sometimes when I hear of something um, tragic that takes place within the church, I get depressed because I'm human. But God's got a way out of it, and that's what I want to give you. How do you know when you're depressed? Dr. Wayne Oates is a clinical psychiatrist, and he says, answer the following question. And if you answer these 10 questions, if you answer seven of them with a yes, then he says you're clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. Answering one or two of them just means you're suffering from a mild depression. Have you suddenly or slowly lost all initiative in relating to other people? Do you experience repeated crying spells that have no apparent Cause oh, women, you're not necessarily depressed when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> have you persistently over a period of weeks awakened suddenly and been unable to return to sleep for over an hour? Do you awaken in the morning feeling tired and face the day with dread? Do you feel unspecified, scattered kind of pain aching all over? Do you find yourself regularly thinking about your own death, wishing life were over? Do you breathe irregularly, sigh repeatedly, and feel heavy in the chest? That's minus the pork sausage. Do you distrust your own wisdom, having trouble making decisions, or feel generally helpless? Do you find yourself irritable, cross, without any reason? Do you have trouble being enthusiastic about anything? Answering yes to each seven of those questions, you're clinically depressed. So right now, we're going to look at Elijah. Elijah got depressed after the Mount Carmel. Can you imagine he defeated the prophet of Baal on Mount Carmel, and then he got depressed? Second Kings chapter 19, verse 2 through 8. Stand, if you will, for the reading of God's word. Read it from the ESV. Now, what's the reading of Elijah's depression? How many of you know he was a man of God? Huh? What did I say? First Kings, excuse me. I said Second Kings? Shame on me. First Kings, chapter number 19, verse number 3. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under the broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him. The angel said to him, told him, get up and eat. Then he looked, and there in his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord returned the second time and touched him. He said, get up, eat, for the journey will be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank. Then on the street from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to horn the mountain of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the blessing of it. Thank you for what you've done here already this morning. The testimonies, the singing, the praise and worship. Lord, it's just been good to be in your house and to feel your presence around us. Now, Lord, we ask that you add to the reading of your word. Lord, open our minds that we might be understanding this. Lord, this, this problem that is paramount in, in, in America today of depression. Lord, even our young people bullied at school in so many ways and they suffer from depression. And Lord, we know that it is not wrong to be depressed. There is no sin in that. But it is wrong for us to allow it to get to the point where it begins to affect our lives and our service to you. So, Lord, I pray you help us to see this morning, first of all, your prescription. And, Lord, to, to, before we do anything else, make sure we're following your plan. And we'll ask that if there's any here that are lost, today they be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Now, first of all, I want you to know that Elijah was physically exhausted. If you remember, after he had stood him out to the prophets of Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal, he ran back to the city. Remember, he outran the king's chariot. You're talking about running for his gun. Forrest never ran like Elijah ran. I mean, he just whizzed right on by that chariot being pulled by six stallions. So as far as Elijah knows, he was closing. When he lays down there and says, Lord, take my life, as far as he knows, he's laying down 
and he's not expecting to wake up. He's expecting God. God had answered his prayer. Sit down far from me. Call down far from heaven. So laying down and saying, Lord, take my life. I suspect he was not thinking about waking up. He had no idea he was going to wake up there and open his eyes again. First of all, I want you to look at Elijah because he's physically exhausted. Did you know one of the major causes of depression is being physically exhausted? <laughs> when you get tired, you're going to get depressed. Sometimes you get depressed because you don't take care of yourself physically. First problem Elijah had, he, he had apparently now run non, nonstop from Mount Carmel over to Mount Horeb, which is about, to Beersheba, which is about 160 miles. As I say, you remember how the forest ran across the country. He ain't got nothing on Elijah. Elijah ran that 160, he ran and ran and ran and rushed, and he was totally exhausted, and he's not eating right. He's not gotten enough sleep. He was thirsty. He was completely physically drained. The Bible teaches us that if you don't take care of your body, as the temple of the Spirit, it affects your emotions. Wives, how many of your husbands, when they get tired and wore out and come home from work, drained and exhausted, they get just a little bit in? Husbands, how many of your wives, when you come home from work physically drained and exhausted, they've had to put up with kids all day long and they've been run ragged and everything's broke down? They're not, they're not in a good mood. <laughs> so you see, being physically drained and physically exhausted affects you emotionally. God said, Elijah, get up. Don't lay there and have a pity party. Get up. Every time I read where it talks about the prayer of Elijah, he said, Lord, take my life. That's enough. I've had it. In 1936, Benjamin. Frank and Knox was preaching it at his church. And he said, on this very text, he said, Elijah said, Lord, it is enough. Let me die. And he turned around and walked down the pulpit and died. Like the middle of the church. Now you say, well, that's terrible. Not from the preacher. I can't think of any other way I'd rather die than back to finishing the message. And it just, I, I, mean, I think it's scared, scared the devil out of some people. What is it? <laughs> I think so. But he said, Elijah, God, and now he answered Brother Dyke's prayer, but he didn't answer Elijah's. He said, Elijah, I'm not through with you. Don't lay there feeling sorry for you. Sometimes when you're depressed, when you don't want to do anything, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to get up out of bed anymore. You ever had those days? I have. I have. I just think, matter of fact, I have set the alarm. I said, I'm not one of these people. Let me just be honest with you. I'm the pastor. I'll take a matter of fact, I'm going to show you in a minute where I try to be open and honest with you. I'm not one of those people who wake up and say, Good morning, Lord. I said, the Lord, I try to get up by 7 o'clock. <laughs> I said, the Lord, for 6.15. I said, one for 6.45. I said, one for 7 o'clock. And Joy will tell you, a lot of times, I'll grab that phone and say, Set the Lord for 7.15. And go back. <laughs> back to sleep again. So I'm not one of those that jumped up all of a sudden. So I had some morning when I just used to stay right there and sleep. I had to get up this morning because I had to come free. <coughs> but um, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, listen, you don't want, sometimes you've got to force yourself to just get up and do what God's asking. And if you've gotten enough sleep, now that's one thing I'll tell you, I have problems getting enough sleep. Number one, I try to stay up and watch TV sometimes too late, especially if there's a ball game on. Oh my, I'm just burying it all in the day, aren't I? Um, Huh? That's up. Confession is good for the soul. I usually try to get about seven hours of sleep a night. I don't always do it. And uh, seven hours, they say, not enough for a man my age. Which, in case you wonder how old I am, I just had my birthday. And for my birthday, the church gave me a rocking chair and a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> So, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, he was a man who believed in activity and served God with diligence. One time he went to a man's house who was having his own personal pity party, and, and he said, uh, Brother Wesley, would you pray that God would give me the strength to get out of his bed? And John Wesley looked at him and said, You get one foot out of bed, and I'll pray for the other one. Amen? <laughs> Sometimes he just got it. And God said, Elijah, don't just lay there and get up. There were three things that he told Elijah that he needed. First of all, God was the first thing is sleep. First thing, you need to take care of yourself, get enough sleep, but you don't want to stay sleeping. Amen? 
you're not getting that enough rest, it builds up and accumulates, and you get what's called sleep deficit, and that makes you ill and irritable and depressed and everything else. Number two, eat. The second thing he did for Elijah was he gave him something to eat. Not only did he give him sleep, he gave him the right food to eat. He fed him, he fixed him a cake and some water. God fed him some kind of cake and gave him water, and he said, Elijah, you're exhausted, you're wore out, you're depressed, and, and that's causing you to think wrong and eat wrong. And so why are you asking me to try to kill you? Get enough sleep and you feel different. And the third thing, and this is important, he said exercise. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Exercise. <laughs> now that don't go like this. <laughs> That's not the exercise we're talking about. <laughs> he got up and he ate and drank and strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights. Not only do I want you to get enough sleep and eat, but I want you to exercise. I want you to get up. Listen, did you know one of the best things for a period of depression is exercise? Mm -hmm. I know that. That's why I try to work out at a regular basis. I didn't do a lot of times, but I've tried to. Um, I go to Planet Fitness and uh, work on the machines. I'm not one of them that's pumping weights trying to get big. I'm just trying to pump weights, stay good, stay fit. <laughs> I want to preach as long as I can. If there's somebody in this room who's going through a time of depression, God's prescription may be as simple as that. But that, what I'm saying to you, these are the first things you do. You get enough rest, you eat correctly, take care of your body, and you exercise. Those are the first things you do. I, do you know that? I think that can cure at least 50 to 60% of the depression in the world today if people would just follow it. Now, there is some above that. And I'm not going to dwell into that. You just need to, see, you need to sit some help. If you're eating right, sleeping right, and getting exercise, and you're still battling depression, then you get to find some, find some help. Amen? <laughs> Even the teenagers, it's okay to say to somebody, I'm depressed, I don't feel right. Matter of fact, that's what you need to do. And I encourage you, we've got too many teenagers that are committing suicide today. We've got too many people that are dying because they think it's a stigma if they ask for help. And that's what I don't want you. I don't want you to feel like that. Secondly, Elijah was spiritually defeated. And I can't believe this. He just, he just defeated the prophet on that carnal. But he's second thing, he's defeated. When you're spiritually defeated, God said, I'll speak to you. In verse 9 through 13 of that chapter, it says, He entered a cave there and spent the night. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone, listen to this, I alone am left. And they're looking for me to take my life. Woe is me, I'm the only one left serving you, Lord. Everybody else has abandoned me. Then he said, go and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by, and a great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and shattering the cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice. Listen to this. A soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? The last time I saw you, you were defeating the prophets on, or the prophets on Mount Carmel. You were calling down fire from heaven. You had great faith. You have great confidence. Now look at you. What are you doing here? And I'm sure that stirred something in Elijah's heart. And he said, well, Lord, I, you're right. I want to hear from you. Boom. There's a mighty wind. And he said, you must be in the wind. But he wasn't in the wind. And boom. There was an earthquake. He said, you must be in that earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then fire. Oh, yeah, you were in fire. I saw you when I called down fire. You were in fire. But he said, the Lord wasn't in fire. Then he heard a still, small voice. What I'm trying to say to you is the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes when you get spiritually defeated, God says, don't depend on the way I used to be able to do. Yesterday's man is no good. It's rotten. The experience you had last year or 10 years ago is not what I want you to have now. I want you to have a new revelation of, me, of myself. So listen up. I'm going to talk to you. And I'm going to surprise you. You'll be surprised the way I talk to you. We expect God sometimes to do for us what he did in the past. And sometimes he speaks to us in a different way. Right. He may not always speak in the same manner. You know what I found? I found depression. Listen to me. <coughs> See if you get a picture of this. 
depression is the shadow. On the other side, the mountaintop experience is God. Are you following me? You have the mountaintop experience with God. Aren't they great when the fire falls and God moves? Man, we just love it. I'm going to tell you, is that mountaintop cast a shadow? Yes, it does. And on the other side of it, many, many times, is a time of depression. Mm. And you know what? When you go to the mountaintop, and you go through the depression, you know what's on the other side of depression? Yeah. Another mountaintop. Mm. And I'm so glad we did. But when we get in that depression, we think we get the rest. See, because what is it? We want God to do it. We want that mountaintop experience all the time. Get over it. That don't happen. Amen? There are some times, huh? That way all the time. You want to appreciate You want to appreciate it. You got, you, now, nah, thank you. You got to go through the valleys to appreciate the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Now, I didn't meet nobody around right here that seemed to appreciate the mountains any more than I did. I've always said the saddest thing in this world is the mountain in the rear of the year. Right? But I remember I left dirty mountain. And I left to go through the valley. I look up and know I'm going up there. Well, let me tell you something. When you get on the dark side of that mountain kind of experience in the depression, just remember I'm going back up another mountain. It's going to be up from here. I, I don't have anywhere to go but up. And life got in that depression because. He was looking for that mountaintop experience. See, the mountaintop experience, listen to me, they're not the ordinary, they're the extraordinary. And when it doesn't happen all the time, and you're depending on those kind of things, you get depressed. Who you ever felt like, well, I haven't heard from the Lord in a long time. It doesn't seem like he spoke to me. Maybe he's speaking in that still, small voice. And you just need to listen to that. The many characters in the Bible who went through shadows of depression. How about Moses? <laughs> Moses delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And he went and struck the Red Sea and or held up his hands at the Red Sea and the waters parted and, and stood up. And they walked through it. And then he got out there and they didn't have any water. So, so he struck a rock and water, water began to camp, come out. And, and uh, everybody was complaining and griping to him because there was no water. I mean, they came out of the wilderness. They came out of Egypt, went into the wilderness, but they, they were delivered at the Red Sea. They said, Moses, Moses, he's our hero. They got out of the wilderness, didn't have any water. They said, Moses, Moses, he's the zero. <laughs> it changed just that quick. I'm sure that was depression. They grumbled against it. They got another Red Sea. How about Jonah? Jonah, got, <coughs> Jonah was told to go out of Nineveh and preach. Jonah said, I'm not going to do that. I don't like the Ninevites. I'm not going to preach to them. They might, get, uh, they might repent. So he went in a different direction. He thought, created a storm and had a great fish to swallow him up when they threw him overboard and he decided, I think I'll go down to Nineveh. So he went down to Nineveh and he preached and guess what happened? The Ninevites repented. It says from the greatest to the lowest of them, they repented. They said, you're right, Jonah. We repent. But have you ever read the fourth chapter of Jonah? He's sitting under a tree, under a gourd, vine right and said, I just wish I hadn't even been born. Mountaintop experience. The shadow of it is depression. Depression is a shadow that's cast right after a great mountaintop experience. This man, here's Elijah, fresh from Mount Carmel. He was in that mountain, he was in that depressed state. I'm asking you there, are you looking for God in the wrong place? Are you looking for him in the whirlwind that you saw him in last time or the great experience you had last time? Just look for him where he is in your life. It may be still. Be still and know that I am God. When you're depressed, it may be a problem, not just a physical problem, it might be a spiritual problem, but he'll speak to you in a different way. Get up, I'll feed you. When you're spiritually feed you, you should listen to me. The third one, and I think this is where a lot of people are today who suffer depression. He was emotionally depleted. He was emotionally exhausted and depleted. It might be an emotional problem that you're having. God says, listen, link up with other people. Because i got others to help you. Remember, he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. He replied, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets, and sword. I alone am left. I'm the only one who is doing your will. And look what God said to him in verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, Go and return the way you came to, 
the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you're in North Hazel as king over Abraham. You are to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elijah, son of Shepha, from uh, Abel Meola, as prophet in your place. Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, and Elijah will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. Listen. Remember, Elijah, Elijah said, I'm the only one. He said, but I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah left there, and he found Elisha, son of Shepherd, as he was plowing. Twelve team of oxen were in front of him, and he was with the twelfth team. Elijah walked by him and threw his mantle over him. Elijah left the oxen and ran to follow Elijah. And he said, please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I'll follow you. Go back, he replied, for what have I done to you? So he turned back and followed him, took the team of oxen, slaughtered them with the oxen, with the open plow, he cooked the meat, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he left, followed Elijah, and served him. So I want you to see the following with Elijah. He said, God, I've had enough. Take my life. He was physically exhausted. He was spiritually defeated, but he was also emotionally defeated. He was lonely. Lonely. He said, I'm the only one left. You ever feel like you're the only one left? You ever feel like the whole world's against you? God said, link up with somebody. Find somebody to link up with and share your burdens with. Some seminaries teach that pastors, I'm going to really blow your mind here. I mean, I've been told this many times. They teach that pastors need to be professionally separated from their congregation. That they need to be different from their congregation so they can be pastors. Don't make friends. I was told, don't make friends with your church members. <laughs> Troy just got me a book the other day by Dayton Hartman. This he's a pastor in Rocky Mountain, graduate of Rivers University. It's called Lies Pastors Believe. I've been through this thing, did the little work books and all that kind of stuff. The chapter in here, well, I got this message ready, I know I'm going to read this book. It's called The Holy Man. And which he talks about this very thing. Most Christians want to assume their pastor has a special connection to God. Therefore, the concept of many Christian circles is for pastors to embrace the holy man in his feet and stay separate from their congregations. <laughs> That's a big theological term. If there's any truth to that philosophy, you're in trouble. All right, exactly. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Listen to me. And Dayton Hartman, of course, I'd already said this before I read what he wrote. I'm a sinner just like. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen. The only difference is God has called me to preach his gospel. He's called you to preach his gospel, but he's called me to do it full time. Amen? He's called you to preach it full time, but he's called me to preach it full time and let you take care of me. Right. Amen? <laughs> That's the only difference. I go through the same problems that you do. I go through the same conflicts that you do. I face the same temptation that you do. Men, when I get up in the morning, I put my pants on just like you do, one leg at a time. Unless you're in the Navy, Gary. <laughs> you learn in the Navy, you put on sitting down two legs at a time. Amen. Right? You know why? Because if you only ship rolling, you hold up one leg. <laughs> You're going to kiss the bulkhead in just a minute. <laughs> I'm no different. <clears throat> and I want you to look at me as no different. Now, I want you to respect the call that God has on my life. A couple of things about like that. And that's God. That's not me. That's right. Somebody said, one preacher said, if I could do anything else than preach, I'd drive a truck and more money with it. <laughs> Preaching is feathers one day and chicken one day and feathers the next. Basically, that's what it is. But you know what? I'm in it because that's what God wants me to do. But I'm your pastor, so respect that. But don't put me up on the post. I, I hate the fall. This is my age. <laughs> Much better than used to. But I don't know where we get the idea that pastors should be so much separated. I, 
I'd rather be close to you and identify with you because then I can feel your heartaches, I can feel your disappointments, I can feel your joys, I can feel your pleasures. I can laugh with you, I can cry with you because I know what you're going through. I think that's what Jesus did. He didn't separate himself from the people. He embraced them. I think that don't make friends with members in church is why 70%, according to a recent leadership magazine, 70% of America's pastors said they don't have any close friends. 70%? And 1,500 ministers leave the ministry every week. 1,500 ministers. They don't have any strength. They don't have any network to help them out. Elijah, God said, Elijah, I know you're depressed or you think you're all alone. That's not true. I've got 7,000 and I'm just like you around here. So when you're depressed, you need to look around and you need to find brothers and sisters in Christ to reach out to them, to share your burdens, to share those. You need a small group of friends with which you can relate, where you know their names and you know them personally. Small group studies is a great place to do that. Say amen. amen. Then you need a large group where you may not know everybody. We're not that large, but I doubt down here saying some people in here you don't know. It's called Tabernacle Baptist Church. But link up with them. Share the problems. If you don't link up with problems in a small group, link up with the large congregation. The Bible says, listen, don't just lie there, get up if you're depressed. Don't think there's no voice from God. Listen up, God's speaking to you. And don't think that you're all alone. Link up with others. How many of you know now? Mark Unger says a man will never tell another man his problems unless he thinks that man can fix it. But men, we, we have to be a little bit different than that. We have to share our problems so somebody can help us fix it. That's why we started men's groups to try to uh, share one another's burden. Now, I found out men go through the same thing. We all go through the same thing. Maybe different times, but at some point in our life, we're going to face the same temptation, the same trials. Say, <laughs> men, how many of you men have y'all ever been with your wife? <laughs> See, you thought you were the only one. Because you ain't never shared it with anybody. Say amen. <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is that's where you find, when you bond together like that and you share your troubles and trials, you find out, hey, somebody else went through this. How'd they get through it? Well, they did it this way. They learned to say yes, dear. We need to feel the closeness of you and you to us. We need to feel comfortable in being able to come to you and ask you for some guidance. I know. I, and that's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be close enough to me that you feel comfortable knowing that it's taking school enough to ask me for guidance. And, and, and I'll try to seek God's guidance. Not, not my guidance, but God's guidance. But that's, that's what it's all about. So I want you to understand. I guess what I'm trying to get at is this. Uh, I don't want you to be so afraid to tell somebody I'm going through depression. I'm, I'm not feeling well today. This is a place, Trisha sings a song. It's okay to not be okay. This is a safe place. And that's what church is. Church and the body of believers. You see, the church is not the building. The church is the body of believers. And the body of believers should be a safe place where you can look at somebody that you love and you know loves you and say, you know, I don't feel okay. I'm not okay. I need some help. And then you can come together and you can pray together and you can look in scripture together and you find God's solution to the problem. And that's what church is all about. That's what Christ brought us. I'll close with this illustration. Man came to a pastor who was going through great financial crisis. The man lost literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. He owed everybody. And the pastor asked him, he said, how in the world are you even surviving? How can you smile? How can you have a good person? How can you be enthusiastic about Jesus and about life? When you're going through all these kinds of problems, and he looked at the pastor and he said, next time you're at my house, I'll show you. So it made the pastor curious. So he went to visit him. And he said, I told you I'd show you my source of strength. So he went in the den and there's this beautiful painting. And it was Dan, Daniel in the lion's den. And Daniel was standing there among some clothes. These were not sleeping lions. These lions had their fangs bared and growling, looking at you could just tell they were ready to eat Daniel up. 
But there's a shaft of light that seemed to be falling down from the roof of the cave and uh, in which Daniel and his lines were being kept. And the man said to the pastor, look at Daniel's eyes. And he looked closely. Daniel wasn't looking at the lines. He was looking at the light. So when you get surrounded with a lot of adversity and a lot of hard times, don't focus on that. Focus on the light. Then you want to see the light. Amen? Now, I wanted to preach this message this morning because I really believe that one of the greatest problems we face in the country today is physical pressure from the depressed. Not clinically depressed. Not somebody who has to be institutionalized or anything like that. You're just going through times of depression, whether it's the loss of a loved one, a financial setback, an emotional heartache. All kinds of things can cause a minor depression, and that's normal. But I think sometimes, rather than seeking God's help and the help of God's people, we try to battle it ourselves, and that's when we get closer to depression. And if we just take it to the Lord, and let God use God's prescription and let God speak to us through other people. It can be solved. Head to bow, I would say,